We're coming to you live from the Tony Remby Rock Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club. This is week to week for Wednesday, July 10th, 2019. Now, lately I've often started these programs with some humorous quip, either said by or about the president, and frankly, it's usually at his expense. <laughs> this time it's fair turnabout because we have a Democrat who is so quotable, she has a quote for everything. If only we could figure out what she's saying. I'm talking, of course, about self-help guru Marianne Williamson. <laughs> now, my favorite quote of hers is, quote, your body is merely your space station from whence you beam your love to the universe. Don't just relate to the station, relate to the beams, unquote. <laughs> I'm a self-identified science fiction fan. I'm not sure what she's talking about, but it kind of <laughs> sounds cool. Those are your words to live by, John. Yes. Well, here's another one. We should start sending light, and posting angels around all polling places now, massive force field needed to counter voter intimidation efforts, unquote. So you can't say she's not practical, right? That makes she's, sense. That's an issue we're all dealing with. Well, listen, maybe that balances our scales a little bit. Um, I do occasionally hear from someone who says, hey, you don't have conservatives on the panel that often. Um, it's a fair, fair criticism. Um, so join us on the 30th. We've got someone joining us for the first time from the Conservative Pacific Research Institute. I think he's going to be great. And I hope you'll all show up and give him a warm Commonwealth Club welcome. So with all that said, I'm John Zipper. I'm your host for tonight. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, we've got, I want to introduce our panelists. I'm glad they're all here. Um, I'll start at the far end of the stage with C.W. Nevius. Chuck Nevius is a columnist for the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. You can follow him on Twitter at C.W. Nevius. So welcome back, Chuck. Thank you. Next to him is Bob Butler, a reporter with KCBS Radio. He's on Twitter at Bob Butler 7 And next to me is Molly Riley. She's assignment editor at HuffPost, and she's on Twitter at the most original ever, <laughs> Molly Riley. Uh, I think you all know any room. opinions that we express up here are those solely of the speakers, not of the Commonwealth Club. Everyone is welcome at the club, regardless of your views. Um, and there are question cards throughout the room. Someone will pick them up and hand them to me, and I'll try to work in as many of those as I can during our hour here together. So let's start our round table by talking about an earthquake. Well, two earthquakes with 34,000 small aftershocks, according to the story I saw. Now, so these two strong earthquakes struck the Ridgecrest area in Southern California. The quakes were so strong, they left a fissure in the ground that is visible from space. Uh, there was the, uh, the 6.4 uh, quake on July 4th. That was followed a day later by a 7.1 uh, strike, or hit, whatever. Um, Governor Gavin Newsom says there aren't politics when it comes to this earthquake response. Bob, is that true? And what should the government be doing in a situation like this? Well, oh, I, I think uh, it's safe to say that when you have something of this devastating, that politics, for the most part, does go away. Um, the governor had a news conference, I think it was Saturday, after he had toured the damage, and I, I did stories on that. He said he had called the president. They talked about these things, talked about it right away. The president said, whatever you need is no question, whatever you need. So I do think in this in this case, uh, when the earthquake, uh, something that you can't blame on not managing the forest, politics doesn't apply. <laughs> or, or Democrats, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, President Trump did approve a request to declare an emergency in California and open up some federal assistance for the state and local efforts. Um, Molly, I mean, what do you think of the what of that response, and is there anything else that should be done? Well, I thought it was interesting when Trump first tweeted about the earthquake. He first credited Kevin McCarthy, the most senior Republican in California, with uh, who he spoke to about the earthquake first. So I thought that was interesting, and then he talked about Gavin Newsom. Um, but you know, I think the real test is going to be what happens when the big one actually does hit in a populated area. What is Trump's response then? What kind of levels of funding will happen? And also, will he play politics with the recovery funds later on like he has? Um, for example, during the government shutdown, he talked a lot about withholding the funding for helping people who had been hit by the wildfires last year um, over the border issue with California, especially because Nancy Pelosi was so involved in that shutdown fight. So I think now is kind of hard to say whether or not politics will get involved. But I think knowing who Trump is, we can say it might, that might happen. Chuck, um Wildfires, earthquakes, I mean, we're, we could conceivably get to an area where the 
what the the fund of monies to help out in emergencies is going to be strained. I mean, we were just talking before we came in here about the flooding in New Orleans uh, that's happening. And this, is, by the way, is happening before the tropical storm uh, that is expected to, to right. uh, hit from the Gulf. Um, well, if California had just raked the forests, as, as Trump suggested, I, we, would, we wouldn't have any problem with these, with these, uh, these forest fires. Now, I think everybody's going to jump for the, uh, it, it's a great political issue because it shows you're helping. It shows government is, is sticking up for the, uh, the common man. We were talking in the green room, and um, a couple of years ago, I was, working, I was trying to work on a book about the 1989 earthquake. Um, there was very little interest in that book, by the way, so we're not doing that book. But, <laughs> um, but I ended up talking to a guy at Cal who was an earthquake specialist. And one of the things that he said is that when we get the big one, as Molly said, it's not going to be what we, th what we think of in terms of absolutely flattened cities and so forth. At this point, the building restrictions have kicked in. The buildings will probably stand. We probably won't see horrible, we, we will probably see some, but not horrible loss of life, but those buildings will be damaged. They'll be cracked. And we may not be able to live in those buildings. So it may be a very different challenge than what we've seen traditionally, or what we think of in terms of a natural disaster. So it's just something to keep in mind. But yeah, I'm sure politics will be a big part of it. Yeah, they were probably lucky that this did occur in a less populated area. Um, the only fatality I guess I heard about was in Nevada. It was a man who was underneath a car, working on it, and the car fell on him, and he died, um, which is tragic. And but at the same time, you're also knowing that this could have been worse if. It also know. didn't hurt. This is a rural area. Yeah, mm -hmm. which tends to support uh, Republicans. So. I think funding is also an important issue in preparedness. Um, there were, there's been a lot of talk about these early warning systems that are starting to be implemented in California. In LA, they did have it. It's called Shake Alert, but there's a threshold for when people are notified. And in the city of Los Angeles, people didn't get notified because by the, it was so far from the epicenter, they ended up it being like about a three on the Richter scale, and it has to be at least above a four for them to get notified, I believe. Um, San Francisco, the Bay Area is supposed to get that by the end of the year, they're saying. Uh, funding is an issue for that, though. And if that is held up, then we might not get a warning system like Los Angeles has seen. Yeah, I got an alert this, uh, I think it was this morning on my phone for, I think it was an abduction thing. You know, I don't know if it was Amber Alert, Amber alert, alert or something yeah. else. I mean, that kind of should be what you get, right? right. It's like, and they're not sure if it's going to be that kind of alert or an app. And there's concerns if power is out because of seismic activity that will these systems even work? So there's a lot going into it. Well, we see this over and over. We, we get pretty cocky in California about earthquakes. So we were, uh, I remember when I first, uh, when we were first married, my wife is a Berkeley resident. And I'm from Colorado. And we lived in a frame house in the Richmond district. And there was an earthquake. And the house shook like crazy. And I ran down the hall yelling, earthquake, it's an earthquake, it's an earthquake. <laughs> and she said, we're in California, Chuck. We have a lot of earthquakes. <laughs> And you were like, oh, this marriage oh, right. like that. <laughs> but in 1989, when that earthquake hit, it, it's a whole different game. And, when, and those of us have experienced one, it is extremely unsettling. The idea that everything around you is moving and there is no place to go. So this, these are always a reminder that it is, it, is a serious, it is a serious possibility and something that we have to keep in mind. I'd like the media to, to, to finally understand earthquakes because I never, I saw this headline bulletin breaking news on CBS News. Uh, I think it was on the web that there is a 2% chance of a stronger earthquake next week or 3% chance of a stronger earthquake next week. In my story, I wrote, there is a 97% chance that nothing's gonna happen. Because <laughs> that act, that's actually true. There's all, we're in California, as you say, we're always gonna have a chance to have a large earthquake. and. Now they're saying that the 6.4 was the precursor to the 7.1. They didn't know that on Thursday. They say that that's the case now on Friday. But we just don't know. And uh, you talk about preparedness. How many people here have one gallon of water per person to last for three days in your house? How many have, <laughs> wow. have the food, Impressive. have you know, dry food? How many have a battery-operated radio? Because you know TV ain't going to work when you have the big one, but I'll probably still be on the air. For, for everyone, <laughs> for the folks who are listening to this on the podcast, you should note that just a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people are very prepared. But, I but, then, but then we're in San Francisco, where people have experienced Loma Prieta. 
maybe we're here for 06, I don't know. But you know, <laughs> you know, we take that to heart. I'm thinking about the folks in places like Ridgecrest. Were they prepared for it? A lot of the, one guy, he was, I saw him on TV, he was gone out of a hospital. His mobile home had fell off the bounce. It was on the ground, destroyed. A lot of folks down there weren't ready. They weren't prepared. And that's something that we really have to understand that you may be out there on your own for quite a while. I think we also have to think about all the people that have moved to San Francisco recently that aren't from California and aren't used to earthquakes. And I have a lot of friends who are in that category. I'm a native Barian and I grew up, you know, having earthquake drills in school, having the earthquake kit with me. Uh, but a lot of people haven't had that at level of education. So I think, um, you know, one of the stories I assigned right after the earthquake was what to do to prepare. And I think it's really important that we have that education, not just in schools, but in workplaces, just with public service announcements. The media has a role in that, too. Uh, just making sure that our new residents are as educated as all of you are. Well, uh, for our second topic, let's kind of stick with Southern California. And that is uh, Representative Duncan Hunter. <laughs> uh, he is it, not fun times to be him. He is the San Diego area US representative, a Republican. Um, now, a judge has refused to toss out the corruption case against Duncan Hunter. He and his wife were indicted last year on charges of conspiracy, wire fraud, and campaign finance violations. Last month, his wife pled guilty to corruption, and she named her husband as a uh, co-conspirator in the campaign finance stuff. Um, also last month, a federal prosecutor said Hunter, who, by the way, uh, was a supporter of the Defense of Marriage Act, um, the prosecutor said he spent campaign funds on extramarital affairs with five different women. <laughs> Presumably his wife was not a co-conspirator on that spending. <laughs> um, Molly, Duncan Hunter, he serves in a congressional seat formerly held by his uh, father, who also is called Duncan Hunter. Um, I suppose they could reuse the campaign signs, but uh, what, do you, what do you make of his current troubles and do you think he's done for politically at least? Well, I will say that the indictment came out before his reelection last November, and he did win, although narrowly. Um, so voters were aware of this when they voted for him uh, back in November. It does seem to have gotten worse and worse for him, especially with his wife uh, agreeing to testify against him. There was also an accusation of um, groping uh, that he groped a congressional staffer. She came forward a few weeks ago to say that. Um, he also got entangled in this war crimes case uh, where this former neighbor, Navy SEAL was on trial for... Uh, killing an ISIS captive that the military had, and he came forward and said that he had uh, himself committed a war crime by taking a photo with a dead body while he was serving in the military. Um, so there's been a series of things with Hunter. Uh, whether or not he'll step down, though, I don't know. He is, was one of the first members of Congress to support Trump. I think he is sort of Trumpian in a lot of ways. I don't know that he's going to back down, and he's claimed that all of these uh, affairs and his uh, trips and expenses were all you know, political reasons. He, uh, I think his defense team actually used the phrase mixing business with pleasure, which is pretty unfortunate. Uh, so I don't know if they'll back down. Bob, uh, someone in the audience asks if he could be forced to resign from Congress. I'm kind of wondering, wouldn't his fellow Republicans be wanting him to resign so that they can get someone in who can, I mean, he's in a fairly Republican district, as I understand. So. Yeah. I think someone did a story where they tried to find out, he's been taken off all his, his committees. Yeah. And someone did a story trying to find out what he's doing all day. You know, he's, <laughs> he's over there. He spent, they spent $250,000 of campaign funds on trips to Europe and so forth. And now his attorneys are saying that these affairs shouldn't be included because we're mixing business with pleasure and it's going to be prejudicial. <laughs> <laughs> and I would also point out I think it's important we never forget that they also took their pet rabbit. They had to buy a ticket. Egbert, Egbert, Egbert. And they bought a ticket for him on an airplane with campaign funds. So, Was it a comfort animal? <laughs> like a service animal, that's right. Yes. <laughs> if anybody needed a comfort animal, it would be Duncan Hunter. I would say. Uh, he, he won't, they won't <laughs> let him have him in prison. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bob Hunter's a Marine veteran who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I, I read that he had started a residential development company uh, in 2005. Uh, he then ran in 2007 to replace his, or to succeed his father, who uh, uh, made, as we all know, an unsuccessful run for the president. Um, if he had never entered politics, Duncan Hunter, the younger, could probably have looked forward to a life of earning lots of money as a successful developer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, you know, the prestige of being a veteran of overseas wars who hasn't tied himself to war crimes. Um, <laughs> I mean, was politics like the worst thing he could have gone into? <laughs> <laughs> well, the priesthood would have been worse. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a veteran, um, yep. and I think, it's, I think it's great that he served. Um, taking a picture with a dead body is, dis is despicable. Um, even people who are in war, um, who aren't, as, aren't um, jerks, will tell you that, you know, you have to respect your enemies. People that you fight against, you have to, have, you have to, have to respect them. Um, so with all these things, you would think that he'd be toast. I mean, his campaign against his opponent for the last election, calling the guy a member of ISIS or whatever he said against him because he was, he was Muslim. Or was he even Muslim? He might have just been a Hindu. I don't know. But he had all kind of negative things to say about him. The fear mongering about him being a Muslim, you know, going into Congress and bringing Sharia law. I mean, that stuff is all despicable. But in today's political climate, depending on what party you are in, it doesn't really matter. So you talk about him groping five women and spending money, you know, and he could be president. <laughs> well, let's move from the criminal to the really criminally icky, and that is financier Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, he was arrested July 6th on federal charges of sex trafficking of minors, both in Florida and New York. He had previously served 13 months uh, as part of a plea deal and a 2008 conviction for soliciting a 14-year-old girl for prostitution. Um, now, there are a lot of political connections here um, because, frankly, extremely wealthy people have lots of political connections in both parties. In fact, Epstein has befriended or known to one degree or another everyone from Prince Andrew to Bill Clinton to Donald Trump to Katie Couric. Um, so, Oh, well, we're not even done yet. Then there's that 2008 plea agreement, uh, which was handled by former federal prosecutor Alex Acosta, who is now the U.S. Labor Secretary. Um, and that pl plea deal is, of course, being criticized. You've seen the stories about that as being overly lenient to him and being secretive. Um, Chuck, there are a lot of people embroiled in this mess. There are, yes. The, 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 I kind of had to laugh. It's not really funny, but someone said that they went to Epstein's uh, Florida estate. And he went out in the back at the swimming pool, and he said, isn't this great? He's invited all the neighborhood kids to swim. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, you know, I, and activists are saying it, and it should be repeated. These are children. These are children. This is, this is not, you know, a, and they tried him for, for soliciting prostitution. That's not what this was. This is child trafficking. And um, I have to say that the labor secretary went on TV today. I don't know how many people did you see him today. He stood up there for an hour. He took every question, and you knew he was going to he was going to stonewall this and and go through it. And the Republican now the Republican tack is all right. Well, let's quit let's quit worrying about what happened back in two thousand and eight. Let's worry about it was awful. This guy's a terrible person, and now there's going to be uh, federal prosecutors going to be on him. So let's focus on that. But I think you've got to focus on not only did he serve what the thirteen was it thirteen months. But he was allowed to go Work home. Six, yeah. Every, six, six, days, six a days a week, he was allowed to go home. I mean, it's just incomprehensible that, that, this, that this could happen. So when the Access Hollywood tape came out, and we've got a, there's a book out now about this, so many people thought it was the end of Trump's presidency, including Michael Pence, according to the, Mike Pence, according to this book. Um, and he just, he just brazened it out. And when that happened... That, that shifted everything. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are now, is right. that you're going to show up and say, you got it all wrong, it, it's fake news, that's not right, there's a lot of misinformation. And it is that depressing part of politics today. today. Yep. And that is, he is, a, he is the, the poster boy for that. It's, I'm, I'm sure at this point, with this kind of a publicity, something will, action will be taken, he'll serve prison time. But my God, it took this long for that, for people to be that concerned that, that he didn't get away with this. You know, the ir irony for me is that Acosta went on today and said that, you know, he was, he was terrible back then, 
We didn't have all the information back then. Thank God we have it now. We can put them away. And the reporter who broke the story said, hey, by the way, you had the 53-page indictment. You had the secret meeting with his attorneys. You had this and this and this. So basically, she's telling, you could have done this back in 2008, but you didn't. Um, I think Acosta, the more he's on TV, the slimmer his hold on his job is. Because you know our president, if you're on TV more than he is, you're gone. <laughs> I did think it was very telling yesterday, though, in the Oval Office, Trump said he feels very badly for Acosta. And this is just such a pattern for Trump to feel very badly for men who have enabled abuse or have committed abuse themselves. Um, we've seen it, you know, during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. He was extremely defensive of him, of himself, after the Access Hollywood tape and yep. all of these women who have come forward with very credible accusations against him of assault. Um, so I think this is, you know, like Chuck was saying, this is the playbook for the Trump world. Um, I don't know that we'll see unless what Bob is saying is true is the, you know, he's on TV a lot. He might be out. But I think they are going to stonewall as much as they can and distance themselves from Epstein. Although, you know, there are a lot of ties here. There's, you know, this was all happening in Palm Beach when that's where Trump's Mar-a-Lago is. And one of the girls who has come forward publicly to say she was part of this worked at Mar-a-Lago and was recruited in the spot at Mar-a-Lago. Mm -hmm. uh, there are deep, deep ties here to a lot of powerful people. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me was that, you know, the president expressing, you know, concern for 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 Acosta, not one word for the about the victims. Nothing. Yep. Yep. From that, let's move to something more strictly political, and that is the first round of debates among the Democrats took place recently, uh, June 26th and June 27th in Miami, Florida. Um, so in two consecutive nights, 10 candidates in each night made their case for succeeding Donald Trump in the White House. Uh, there were a number of surprises, and I want to talk about some of them here, and as well as what, if anything, we gleaned out of, out of those two nights. Um, so Molly, in, in the second night of the debate, or the second debate of two nights, uh, California Senator Kamala Harris, of course, got into a dispute with former Vice President Joe Biden. What was arguably the biggest story of the night? Do you agree? And was it the biggest story of both nights? Yeah, I think it was the biggest story of the debates because it has been this ongoing conversation. We're still having it. Um, the Bidens did an interview this weekend in which they were pretty critical of Kamala for going after Biden on this issue. Um, I was personally surprised. Um, I think Kamala has kind of taken more of a backseat in this campaign so far than what I expected to based on my experience covering her over the years in California. Um, this was kind of her star moment. Um, I heard a lot from people who were really impressed by her performance that night, who kind of saw her, um, you know, standing up to Biden on that issue as her throwing her stake in the ground and saying, here, I'm here to really challenge you. I'm here to run for this office and I'm not going to couch out to you just because you were the vice president and I worked with you. Uh, so I think it was a really strong moment for her. Um, I also heard a lot about Mayor Pete after that, um, people to judge from Indiana, um, he, he was another kind of shining star that night um, who really made a big impression on a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I do think the Warren-Biden fight was something that's going to continue to be an issue going forward. Bob, what did you think about it? And as well as... Or Harris, I'm Biden. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, you know, sitting there watching, watch, I was watching it, and when she stood back and looked at him directly and said it, I'm like, wow. You know, I've, I've covered her too. I mean, I've noticed since she was DA in San Francisco and and... I was just amazed that he didn't see this coming. You know, he had to have didn't known, prepare for it. didn't prepare for it. Um, I did not know this about her and the busing. And then for the, have that photo go up right away, I mean, they clearly planned for this. I know Gabbard is saying that she, she planned to, to, to uh, ambush him on this. Hey, listen, this is politics, you know, and this is something that you have to, you, you don't have to do it, but she did it. Um, and the, the thing I, I think was the, the best thing for me, she says, I do not think you're a racist. But what you did, you know, really hurt me when I was a child, you know, as a child. I thought that was so effective. And I think he's been stumbling around trying to deal with it. And, you know, it really, sh people are saying, would you love to see her go up against Trump? You know, I, I don't think he'd debate her. I think he would just stonewall it and say, I don't, I don't need to. Yeah. Because he'd look, come off looking awful funny. I mean, just like he'd, he'd, he'd make him nervous like she made Jeff Sessions nervous. Right. Well, I think prosec prosecutorial Kamala Harris is, is her best person. Mm -hmm. when, she, when she does that and when she, when she was grilling uh, Kavanaugh, that's her. She does a great job of that. And you have to do something to stand out. So you want to do this, this moment. But as is so often the case in debates, 
It's not the topic, it's the reaction. And Biden was defensive immediately, mm -hmm. and then was defensive for, defensive for like two days after that. And there was actually a pathway for him to say, hey, busing was not popular. I, I, I said, I didn't like busing, but there was a Republican strategist that said, boy, if the Democrats want to run on forced busing, we'd love that. I mean, that's overwhelmingly unpopular in the United States. And, and he could have said that. The segregationist thing, I think, is tougher, but he still could have said, look, I despise their views on race. This was terrible. But I did convince them to vote for such and such, and I got something done. And instead, he went on this long, perambulating, defensive, terrible. And it is exactly what everyone was afraid about Biden, was that he was going to do that. He's going to put his foot in it, and then he wasn't going to be able to get himself back out of it. And it just reinforced that whole idea. And this is the thing about debates. It's not the practice lines. It's the unexpected moments when you got to think on your feet in front of the entire United States of America, and sometimes you don't come up with the best possible response. And he didn't. And it hurt him. And if, and if he gets the nomination and he is in general election debates with Donald Trump, Donald Trump is going to be blindsiding him with all kinds of claims, mm -hmm. some true, some not. But mm -hmm. if he takes days to come up with a response that he could have said, Look, I wasn't praising the segregationists. I was saying I can work with people on the other side, yep. and yeah. you have to do that. Yep. that. That's an argument you can make. Instead, he, he I, I, what I've been hearing from a number of po folks, was, they were just like, this isn't the Joe Biden. You know, maybe in some of the gaffing, yep. they yep. kind of think that's yep. the Joe Biden they expected, but the inability to respond in yep. time yep. is not the Joe Biden they expected. And his response, which is, come on, I'm, I'm Joe. You know me, I'm a good guy. Yeah. Come on, that's not a response. That's not going to fly anymore. No, it, we're at a very fraught period of, in politics in America. We need absolute straight-ahead answers and not, oh, come on, I'm, I, I was just kidding around with those women. I, I was sniffing their hair, and it, if they were upset <laughs> yeah. with that. Well, uh, I think another thing that he said that I, I, I cringed most recently when he said, well, you know, Barack Obama, you know, he, he vetted me. It's, it's almost like, you know, my friend the black guy vetted me, you know. He's, mm -hmm. It's like... Your friend, That's, black guy, hasn't endorsed you. He hasn't endorsed you either, yeah. He hasn't endorsed anybody. But, you know, it's too early for endorsements, in my view. But I just thought when he said that, I, I know people in the black community are like, you know, that like, kind of, so we'll see what happens. Well, there was kind of that, and then there was the bringing out the wife to kind of, in this interview, to help kind of salvage your camp. And even though this was not, you know, often that happens when, the, the wife is saying, yes, I'm standing by my husband for, you know, sleeping with whoever. It wasn't that, but boy, does it, that was the echo I thought of it, of here, she's going to be the one, you like her, right? Mm -hmm. She's gonna say nice things about her. Totally. Um, I think, Bob, you mentioned uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard's uh, criticism of Kamala Harris, uh, for, yeah, for, for making this attack, and uh, she said it was a political ploy by Harris to get attention. I mean, yep. Bob, that Hello. can be said about absolutely everything anyone does in a political well, debate. What's Gabbard doing right, right exactly, there, exactly. you know? Right. And your point is... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It, it got Tulsi Gabbard some headlines. Right. Yeah, right. but Tulsi Gabbard has her own issues. I mean, the, the thing I remember the most about her on the debates, talking about her military service, her 16 years of military service. My thing is, why didn't you stay four more years and get retirement? You know what I mean? <laughs> But that's, that's, it seems like everything that she's talking about has to do how she knows because of her military service. I haven't heard much of anything else from her. Uh, for her to criticize Harris, I think, is a way to get her name in the news. But, you know, I mean, the next debate is, when is that? Uh, July 30th. Uh, July 30th. July 30th. And, and you have to read a threshold to get on that stage. And, you know, they're going to start winning, winning them down pretty quickly. And I'd be very surprised if she's there. And what this says is we've got to get this field down to a manageable size. Yeah, yes. yeah this, this is This is way too big. But I, I think back to 15, and I remember I was over in, um, in Rwanda in October of 2015. And at that point, there were 17 Republican candidates, including Trump. So it's only July. We've got a few more months bef before we have to really start thinking about winning went down. Like, it's got to happen. Well, like, and we have to point out, this was not even all of the Democratic candidates, right? This was 20 of the, what is it, 24? 24. Um, not 25. Well, not 24. Well, exactly. Right. Yeah, the, the well, now. Uh, most recently, a Representative Eric Swalwell from the East Bay dropped out, and billionaire Tom Steyer dropped in. Thank God we have another billionaire white guy in. <laughs> it's about time they got a fair shake. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Finally, a word from them. Yeah. But, Mo Molly, any surprise in either of those moves? Uh, Steyer, I did find surprising. I, he did say, I think he went to Iowa in January to say he wasn't running. And then here he is jumping in when there's 
23 other people running. Um, it's an interesting move. I'm not really sure what his angle is. He did, you know, kind of criticize the front runners for being entrenched in politics, which is sort of a Trumpian way of looking at the presidential race, saying that, hey, they've been in the Senate a long time. They're Washington. I'm an outsider. Here's an alternative for you. Um, so I don't know. It's an interesting thing. He has been doing a lot uh, with his private foundation um, that he's fundraised for. You know, he's fundraised a lot for impeachment, but also he's worked on voter registration initiatives and stuff like that. And that seemed kind of to be more of an influential path for him. So I think a lot of people are questioning why he's jumping in now. Yeah. Another outsider. How's that working out? For yeah, how's it working yeah. out? Yeah. <laughs> well, I like what David Brooks, the, the New York Times columnist, said when he said these self-affirmation classes are working because now everybody <laughs> thinks they can be president. <laughs> yeah. I saw I saw somebody's tweet talking about Starr could do, do much better using his money, taking back state houses and taking back the Senate. Yeah. That, I'm, yeah. and, and frankly. Some of these candidates that we have right now, in my view, I say we, the Democratic candidates, some of them could actually do a be much better for the country if they would jump out of the presidential race and run for the Senate in their home states. Yeah. I mean, you've got quite a few of them that could actually, don't know if they could win, yeah. but given maybe that's, maybe that's their plan. With Swalwell, you know, his, people know who he is now. You know, it's going to help him in his reelection. It probably will help him down the road in committee assignments and things like that. But I would, I'm wondering why some of these people, you know, like the governors that really don't have a shot to win, but could probably win their their U.S. Senate seat and maybe try to flip the Senate. Because that's if you don't do that, it doesn't matter if you win the presidency. If you don't if you don't get both houses anymore, you're done. Well, I was going to ask if he thought that Eric Swalwell had accomplished what he sought. You know, he he got out soon before it got embarrassing, as one person said. You know, he didn't generate a lot of ill will toward himself by attacking others, and he raised his name recognition, so. Well, I think, I think he did what he set out to do. If that, if that was his plan, he accomplished his plan. And the one line that you'll take away from him is pass the torch. You and know? I, I have to build on that. Someone wrote in, aren't Biden, Sanders, and even Warren too old to run for the presidency? No, I don't think anybody's too young, too old to run for the presidency. You can certainly do it, and it's been done. Ronald Reagan's still one of the most beloved presidents of all time, but I think you're. I think when you're talking about someone like Bernie Sanders, you're running the risk of. I've heard this. I've heard this recording. I've heard this record. You know, uh, it's inexcusable. We have to do something. Yeah, we've heard that. Okay, that's good. It's like. Is that, is yeah. That, yeah. It's like, you know, the Simpsons thing, uh, man yelling at a cloud, you know, that whole, yeah, I'm going to stop this. Uh, so I, I think that's that's more of a problem than anything else. Um, and it's interesting that Elizabeth Warren is gaining some traction. You know, when she says, I have a plan, people are like, that's, I'm, I'm interested in that. Yeah. Yep. And, and I should note the latest poll I saw has Biden, uh, Warren, Harris. Mm -hmm. right. so that, yeah, Sanders is not in the top three. Yep. Obviously, there are going to be tons of polls. Every right. month, every week, and every month. I think I think there's a certain amount of Bernie fatigue. Um, I know that he's very popular in San Francisco. I went to when he was here. I went to the rally there. People love Bernie Sanders, but you know, you, you can only promise so many free things, you know. Um, and people start to ask the question, "Well, how are you going to pay for that?" You know, and they say, "Yo, we'll, we'll close the loopholes. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll get rid of the tax cut. Well, how are you going to do that?" You know, so I think that's what I think a lot of people are starting to look at that as saying, hmm. And then I think there's still a little bit of, you know, Bernie, if it hadn't been for you, Hillary would have won. Yeah. 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 I think uh, age is less of an issue than fresh ideas. And yep. I think why, you know, Biden, we see, you know, he is still the front runner by a long shot. Um, but a lot of that is name recognition at this stage in the campaign. Uh, you know, politically engaged people are paying attention, but the general public isn't. And when they get pulled, you know, but Biden is a name they recognize and see. Um, but seeing people like Warren and Harris and, um, you know, even Mayor Pete rising in the polls, Mayor Pete is really doing well in fundraising. Yeah. Um, you know, those are people that are new to the stage relatively. Like Warren's only been in Congress since 2012. So, you know, even though she might be older than some of the other candidates, she's relatively new to the political scene. Um, so I think these fresh ideas are really what are getting people excited. And, and we love the fresh ideas, but do we have to go quite so far? I mean, I think what Amy Klobuchar said, which is, you know, it's a great aspiration to have Medicare for all, but are we, we really talking about throwing half of America off of their personal private insurance, medical insurance programs? It's going to be tough to do that. It, 
And, and that's where Biden would have an opportunity to, to say that if he wasn't stepping on his foot so often. And the same thing, I think, who was it, Harris and, and, and Sanders both. Yes. Saying, get rid of fiber insurance. Well, you know, frankly, I, I like my insurance. Right. <laughs> I'd like to well, be able to keep it. And, and I think this is the concern about, about Harris, who I really want to support, is that she jumps on these things. Right. Her recent idea to get $100 billion, uh, you know, for to help people with black, black people get housing... It may be a great idea, but boy, what a red flag that is for the Republicans. They're going to say, this is socialism if I've ever seen it. She jumped on the, the, the Green New Deal. She did the Medicare for All and then said you misunderstood the question. Uh, it, just take a minute and think about this stuff before you, before you decide what is going to be your cornerstone issues. And that, that concerns me about her. Uh, someone asks if Joe Biden should announce that he will choose Michelle Obama as his running mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be po- popular. I think Michelle Obama should choose Joe Biden. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think Michelle would say no. Would say no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, now, I have to admit to note uh, regarding Eric Swalwell's exit, his communications director is former week-to-week panelist Josh Richmond from the East Bay. I was kind of looking forward to Josh, who is smart and funny, becoming the White House press secretary. So, <laughs> yeah. alas, that will not take place. Someone else I asked... I saw Josh today had... Uh, uh, he posted he got 19,000 emails uh, in his inbox since he's, I guess he was on vacation or something, but uh, I need to send him a text. Say, Josh, read your emails. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> your constituents want to hear from you. Another question. Does anyone know which candidates the Democratic Party inner circle supports? Are there establishment favorites? I mean, you would traditionally kind of say Joe Biden because he's you know been around, he's got all those connections. I don't know. I, I think Warren would be in there, too. Yeah. I think Harris would be in there, too. And people say, why, why not Bernie? Well, they might support Bernie, but people got to remember, Bernie's not a Democrat. He only runs as a Democrat because he can't run as an independent. He could, but he wouldn't get any traction. And I think a lot of people hold that against him. And that it's kind of like, you know, when you're in high school and, you know, you're, you've been to school for the last 12 years with all your classmates, you went for class president, you know, and then some kid that came in in junior year said, I'm going to run for class president, you know, and I expect to be treated just like, like John over there. But, but, you know, I mean, John, we, we had measles together. You know, we, we, you know, we ran track <laughs> together. We did all this stuff together, and you're just coming, you're trying to come lately. And it's not, it doesn't always work. How do you think Marianne Williamson did in the debates? <laughs> <laughs> hey, she's the official spirit animal of week to week from now on. <laughs> she's a former HuffPost blogger. Is so, she really? Okay. Yep. Well, so spirit on. animal. They're, they're, they're going to trump hate with love. That's it. Yep. Well, um, she does have foreign policy uh, advice. She said, quote, not in the debate, but she has said, quote, we should mentally quarantine the government of Syria, send them and their minions surrounded by a golden egg that their malevolence cannot penetrate. Within the egg, let's shower them with light to awaken them, unquote. So, how, does she, how does she get on the stage? Just a moment of silence to absorb that. <laughs> um, as, as we mentioned before, the next Democratic primary debates will take place in Detroit on July 30th and 31st. They'll be starting at 5 p.m. Pacific time, so more fun coming up. Um, in other candidate news, let's talk a bit about Justin Amash. He's the now former Republican House of Representatives member who has come out in favor of impeachment. He's also a, considering a run for the White House. Um, Molly, any thoughts on that? I'm not that it, I'm not saying. Do you think he'll win? I mean, just what could he be a spoiler? Could he do anything, or is this him getting his uh, profile up? Uh, I think you know a little of both. Maybe um, he has been a frequent critic, critic of Trump. He's probably the most outspoken Republican by far mm-hmm. in Congress right now, speaking out against Trump. Um, you know, I think he's also kind of always been like a rogue player. He's has he's a libertarian. He's, you know, got this independent streak. So I think, you know, it's very possible that he will run for president. Whether or not it will have a big impact, it's hard to say what voters he would be taking from who. Um, you know, it's likely he might take a little bit of Trump support, but he could attract some people who, you know, are more moderate Democrats who are looking for a more middle of the road candidate, depending on who ends up being the nominee. Um, so I think it's kind of hard. Middle to of the road candidate that started the Tea Party. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, if nature abhors a vacuum, so does politics. And there hasn't been anybody running against Trump. Right. So it's an opportunity for somebody to, what John was saying about Swalwell, you can raise your, raise your image, raise your brand. 
uh, possibly you get on a stage and, and debate President Trump. It, it would be interesting. You might be able to score some points. But, you know, realistically, it's Trump's party. Um, Republicans are cowed. They're afraid to they're afraid to go against him. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a Democrat that will that will challenge President Trump, no question. When Adam Schiff was... It'll be the Ross Perot of... Uh, well, where is Ross could, Perot? Yeah, today? Ross Perot that's right. That's right. not going to run. Dead and gone, but still, that's where's the Ross Perot kind of guy? When Adam Schiff was at the Commonwealth Club, he was asked about, uh, do what do Republicans say to you You know, when the cameras aren't around? What do they say to you in private? And he says, oh yeah, he has even senior Republicans who will pass him in the hall and say, keep doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, but we keep, I, I don't we need keep private. hearing that, but yeah. where are they? Well, yeah. you know, what are he's we, saying is, are we going to govern or are we, gonna, are we just going to run our, our, our basic idea of, I'm going to protect my district, protect my seat? I mean, I, I keep hearing that. I know. Everybody says that. Oh, there's tons of people behind it. They're really trashing him. Yeah. Where are they? They want to protect their seats. I mean, it's just amazing to me how much this president has cowed, not just the Republican Party, in some, in some cases the Democrats, in some cases the independents, but even the British because their ambassador resigned today after getting to his tip with the president. It's like, if everybody in the world is going to be cowed by him, mm-hmm. how the hell are you going to beat him in the, at the, in the polls? Yeah. yeah. I think we have to come to grips with the fact that he has no floor. He, he, he will go lower than anybody, you know? <laughs> calling that guy a pompous moron. Calling, calling the ambassador a pompous moron. Right? And that's why a lot of his base loves him. Yep. Because it's like, you know... That's they, why you don't want to take him on, because yeah. why, why would you want to have to deal with that kind of, right. that kind of vitriol? It's it's unpleasant. It's difficult, you know. Well, let's let's go into something on uh, the Trump administration is dealing with currently, and that is the effort to put a citizenship question on the U.S. Census. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against the administration's attempt. Don't matter. Uh, you know, yep. And they uh, the president then said, "Okay, we're not going to do it." And very quickly, the administration walked that back and said, "Yeah, we're going to find a way." Um, the administration then suffered another setback this week when a federal judge uh, rejected an attempt by the administration to change the legal team that was basically trying to make up a new reason for why they, they had done it originally. Interestingly, the Supreme Court had put the kibosh on the first attempt because it said the government had not given a realistic explanation for why they needed this question on the, on the census. And this U.S. District Judge uh, Jesse Furman from New York he denied the request to change the, the lawyers in, involved in the team because he said the request was patently deficient, partly because the Justice Department had not given a reason for making the change. Um, Bob, I mean, it does not sound like the Trump administration has the A-team working on this, that they couldn't come up with a reason that they, could get they past only, a only, Republican court. Only the best people. Yes. That's what they've got. <laughs> no, I, you know, it, the, the Supreme Court basically said, I don't believe what you're telling me with these reasons for putting this question on, on, on the census. Um, and the judge, uh, his name again, the one in New York. Uh, Jesse Furman, I believe. Furman. So they, there was a call last, I think last Friday, in which, no, it was the Wednesday. day before, it was Wednesday, in which he called the lawyers, he called the Justice Department lawyers, um, and said, uh, wait a minute, you told me yesterday or Monday that this, we're done. And then I see a tweet from the president saying, we're not done. So which is it? And they're humming, humming, humming. Hum. They don't know. Because, they, you know, as far as they knew, it was done. Um, and he said, but you, when you first came to me, you said you had to have this done by a certain date because, you know, okay. June 30th, because you had to print. The, you know, it's, it's just a mess. And if I was a betting man, I bet the administration will, will defy everybody and, and reprint the forms with that question on it. And it's going to fall to people like me who will work at an enumerator in 2020 on how you're going to do that. You can't not ask the question, but I think it's going to be a big problem if it's on there. Well, and the attorney, when the tweet came out, said, in so many words, I have no idea what we're talking about here, but uh, I'll get back and see. You know, it was it was out of the blue, as so much is. Mm-hmm. If I didn't know any better, I think the British ambassador was right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of chaos in this administration. <laughs> yeah, I really recommend going and reading that transcription of the call between the lawyers and the judge because it's really a fascinating document to yeah. see this confusion within the Justice Department. You know, these are the allegedly the top lawyers 
representing the government and they have no idea what's going on. That's um, really where you should start saying, I'm sorry, what? Hello? <laughs> what? We've got a really bad connection. <laughs> here. Yeah. I'll scratch the, 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 the best couple of lines is when the judge, the attorney said, well, you know, Your Honor, I understand that, but it's now the 3rd of July. Perhaps we could put this off until Monday. <laughs> it's going to be kind of hard to get people, you know, over the 4th of July holiday. Judge response, no. <laughs> Period. Yeah. No. Um, speaking of the 4th of July, <laughs> uh, it's six days too late, but happy 4th of July, happy Independence Day. Uh, last week on Independence Day, President Trump brought out the tanks and gave a long speech in which, among other things, he praised the brave Continental Army that took the airports from the Redcoats. Um, <laughs> And that wasn't easy. Lot, that sorry. wasn't easy. Nope. You know. It was not. It was, yes. Because they were in the airport. I thought so. they were able to find them. Yeah. <laughs> um, as always, obviously, there's a lot to talk about about the president. But let's start with uh, the 4th of July. And Bob, you mentioned you're a military veteran. What did you think of the military presence at that event? Was it too much or was it a needed reminder? I mean, that was how we got independent. Well, not with a tank. As a veteran, um, I know, and I never had to march in a parade, but I know that that's one thing that veterans don't like to do, um, especially those who have fought in war. They, they don't see the point in, in, a, in a show of strength like that. Um, I, I will say that it's not the first time we've had an event you know, highlighting the military, mm -hmm. but it's just doing it on the 4th of July is such a... It, it's it's such a it's so distasteful, um, and people were worried about the president using it as as a as a campaign event. Oh, his speech was was surprisingly nonpartisan, some would say, but they did give out tickets to the RNC to give away to big donors to get to the front row. So it was a campaign event, and for that reason, I I'm 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 all out. Well, they were worried his speech would be political and turn out to be a book report. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean. And then there was a Revolutionary War, and everybody fought there, and then we didn't, you know. And they went to the airports. Well, yeah. They went to the airports, and they were, well, I don't know. It, it, you know. An old friend of mine who was a sports writer used to have a phrase. He would say, who asked for this? <laughs> and it's always a good question. Who, who exactly asked for this? And he did to make a big spectacle, and now he says he'll, he'll do it again. But it was pointless and, uh, and bankrupted the District of Columbia's security fund, by the way. Right. I don't know if Which you saw I'm sure that. he'll pay back. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he'll do that, yeah. yeah. But, you yeah, know, they had $1.2 million set aside for security in District of Columbia, and that, that blew the entire budget. So. Went not over it. I think it was 1.6. Oh, six. The, oh. Well, it was what they had, the expense. So they're in the red now. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you but, go. There you go. Yeah. It's just, I, I lived in D.C. for a while, and the idea that the 4th of July in D.C. wasn't already a huge patriotic spectacle is completely ridiculous. It's they do Fourth of July like nowhere else. They're amazing fireworks. They shut down the entire mall. It's a huge deal. People come from all over to celebrate the Fourth of July already in DC. Uh, to act like we needed another parade mm -hmm. to, you mm -hmm. know, put this expense. I read that the Pentagon spent over a million dollars on the aircraft that were used. Um, there was also national parks funds went to this about 2.5 million dollars that were from, uh, you know, the fees that we all pay when we go to a national park for maintenance for park yeah. maintenance. Uh, so this is a hugely expensive event, and even though it wasn't uh, outwardly political in his speech, the message it sends is political. And I never did see any shots of the crowd. Did you? <laughs> no, but I did hear, did read somewhere, not from the Republicans, but. That the crowd actually was decent size. Mm. I mean, I think it was. I think it was. I mean, it's, but the, it's always decent size in DC for the Fourth of July, right? Yeah. Right. I also saw there were some photos put out um, with people in jackets and watch caps and things, and it, they say it's actually they think that was from the Women's March, <laughs> not the Fourth of oh, July. Wow. Um, in other presidential news, the president got into a spat with the U.S. national, the women's national soccer team, which is the only. American soccer team that apparently knows how to win World oh, Cup. Four of them. Yes. Uh, Molly reportedly, most if not all of the players have said they would refuse to go to the White House if they were invited. What do you think about that? Is it good? Bad? Uh, you know, I think it's great they're speaking out, speaking their minds. Um, it was pretty entertaining to see Trump go after Megan Rapino on Twitter and, you know, basically be like, okay, win the World Cup and we'll see what happens. And <laughs> she went on the World okay. Cup, and uh, I think the White House has now 
you know, decided they're not going to offer an invite because they don't want to get egg on their face and look silly. But, uh, you know, it's been really fun watching these women um, be very openly political and be openly celebratory of their win. Um, The parade today in New York City was a lot of fun to watch. Um, There was a lot of speeches that happened. And, um, you know, the message overall was, you know, you know, it was an anti-Trump message, if not explicitly. Um, so it was really interesting to see this. And a lot of athletes are afraid to speak out politically, and these women are not. And it's not just this current team. I mean, the the women's teams and from the U.S. You know, we've we've seen them. They're 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 kind of fearless in talking to the press and being open. And I don't know. Could we name more than one or two of the male? And I, I don't want to rip on the American male men's soccer Donovan. team, but it sounds like you kind of are there, John. It just seems to me you're kind of ripping on the American men. Today. Well, <laughs> when they can get half as many of the World <laughs> Cup, the championships that the uh, women do, if they can hold get to, get to the finals. Yeah, <laughs> well, get good. to the World yeah, Cup, yeah, they get yeah. yeah. But the women's jersey is the most is the most in demand jersey in in soccer in the United States. Uh, they outdrew in terms of uh, TV ratings the men. Uh, you know, the idea that the men they, didn't play. Well, that was part of the problem. <laughs> they played no, They played in CONCAF. They played against Mexico and lost, right. to John's point. Right. Uh, but the idea, I mean, what everyone said is, well, of course, these women want uh, equal pay. And if they only drew like the men and if they only, well, that, that argument's gone. Mm-hmm. OK, yeah. so the, so they did. And um, Chuck Schumer's already invited them. Uh, Nancy Pelosi's Nancy already Pelosi, invited yeah. them. Uh, Trump is way behind on this, and they've already said we're not going. So it's, you know, he he picked the wrong fight. I'll it's, say the Commonwealth Club is also inviting them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'd love to have any of them. We'd love to meet Well, the real reason they're not going to go to the White House, they don't want to eat hamburgers. Right. <laughs> that only knows what he'd serve. Right? Well, besides feuding with the soccer stars, of course, we, as we already mentioned, President Trump uh, took on the U.K. ambassador, and uh, that ambassador today resigned. Um, Bob, any thoughts on this? How does it affect our relationship with the United Kingdom? I mean, they've been one of our closest allies, at least since we defeated them in the Battle of LaGuardia. I think I, I, <laughs> they're over that now. I think the operative word is were. Because I don't think any of our strongest allies are our strongest allies right now because of what's happening in the White House. I think, I think they will still support the United States. Um, but, you know, what this ambassador, what, amb- what Sir Dara said is not all that far from the truth from what we've seen ourselves. Um, and you have to think that others are saying the same thing. I mean, the thing, what he said, you, you have to flatter him. You've got to, if you say nice things to him, then he'll be, every, every, that's all you need. Um, and that's, that's a really sorry state to be in that if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. I'm not making that up. Because that has come out of our president's mouth more than once. And I think that's really sad. The Onion joked that uh, Theresa May was having trouble finding a replacement uh, ambassador because they all think the same thing about her. <laughs> 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 um, well, this won't make the president happy. New York State is readying the release of Trump's state tax returns to congressional Democrats. Specifically, there was a bill signed by the governor that allows three tax committees in Congress to request this, uh, the returns and, and reports. Um, Chuck, what do you think of this latest front on the war? Because you know Trump will go to war on this. He will, and that's, that's fine. But eventually this is going to come out. I, mean, I keep being reminded of... Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the TV show, The Circus. And they said on there, you know, uh, when Trump came in, he said, Trump is a battleship. You know, he's, he plows through everybody. But Washington is the ocean. And it's true. I mean, there's little by little in granular advances, this is going to happen. And, and I think his, his tax returns will become public. I think a lot of this will become public. I keep looking back. Jerry Nadler said that he dealt with Trump a lot in New York in, in, uh, in building. And he said that um, by the time Trump finished one of his projects, everybody hated him. <laughs> the architects hated him, the contractors hated him, the workers hated him. And I think that's his problem. Is he, and he said the other day, he said, I wear people out. He's going to push through, push through, push through. But eventually people, I mean, someone like Hope Hicks, who was in his, in his inner circle, didn't want to be there anymore. And I think that's what happens with him. That's what happens with his with his 
I, I was started to say principles, but I don't want to say principles. But that's what that's what happens with his what he wants to do is he keeps pushing his way through, and eventually he trips himself up, and those tax returns are coming out. And when they do, I'm sure there's a reason he's been trying to keep them so quiet. Mm-hmm. He's like that kid in school who wants to be liked so much that he just makes himself a real pain in the butt, and it's like nobody really likes him because he wants to be liked so much. And I think that's what we have here. Um, we're almost done, aren't we? We are. I gotta ask. I, I I gotta say one thing. Next week, if I can at all possible, I want to watch Mueller testify. I want to see what he has to say. I don't know that it's going to be the big, you know, extravaganza people think it is. But I think it would be interesting. I want to see what the Republicans ask him because they're really going to try to talk about how. You know, it, the investigation was a farce from the very beginning. I want to see how he handles that to see whether or not, you know, he kind of says, well, whatever. Or he pushes back and says, look, when you have all these people having me- secret, secret meetings with, with Russians and lying about it, we have to find out what's going on. So that's what I'm curious about. I think uh, that will get very high ratings in, across the Bay Area, yes. Um, before we get to the news quiz, a couple, uh, I'll actually end with more court news on the president. He got some good and bad news from courts recently. Uh, He declared victory after a three-judge panel unanimously struck down an emoluments clause case, if you know what I'm talking about, regarding his hotels in foreign countries, you know, enriching him, et cetera. Um, And uh, so that went for him. I believe there's another related or similar case. Yeah, the Democrats have a a case also. Um, But then the bad news for him was a court ruling that Trump cannot block critics on Twitter. And Molly, as I understand it, the ruling was based on the fact that he uses his personal Twitter account to do government business. Right. And therefore, it, it falls under certain things. What do you think about this? Uh, well, I know a lot of journalists are blocked by him. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people are blocked by him in general. Uh, so this is interesting. This is just such a fascinating thing because Twitter has never really been as important as it is right now. Um, you know, when Obama was president, of course, we had Twitter, but... <coughs> It was not used in the same way that Trump uses it. Um, I know a lot of people I work with who have push alerts on their phones for whenever Trump tweets, they get a pop up. I am not that crazy. I can't do that. (laughs) Uh, But it's, you know, it's important, valuable public information. So it makes sense that this would be, uh, you know, the ruling. Um, That being said, there are now people suing Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for blocking them on Twitter, um, which I think is an interesting development. Obviously, her role is not the president of the United States. I think this is kind of a, you know, trolling in some respects. Uh, well, if, but it's if, interesting to see what the legal ramifications are going to yeah, be down the road. But I mean, if the same principle applies, mm-hmm. that if she's using her personal account as a federal employee, I mean, we see this with uh, federal employees, cabinet members, et cetera, who come here and speak. We usually will have them try to get them to sign a speaker agreement so that we can use the, you know, on the radio, a podcast, blah, blah, blah. It's basically them just saying, yes, we have the right to do that they usually will not sign it, not because they don't want us to push it out, but they're saying, as a federal employee, anything I say, I can't assert ownership over it. So if I actually said you had the rights to use this, that would be me asserting ownership. I mean, th- th- I think there are pretty strict rules that, that go beyond just the president, that they all, mm-hmm. and I respect the fact that, that they're, they, they adhere to that pretty strongly. Well, who's going to oversee this? Who's going to make sure that Trump isn't blocking uh, I believe it's going to be just Jared Kushner. Is it Jared Kushner? Yeah. <laughs> Someone points out maybe from the time when he's, you know, time off from his being ambassador for peace. Good one, John. That's very good. Okay. Listen, we'll have a lot more news quiz questions and so much more to talk about, including Robert Mueller at our next program on July 30th. Uh, thanks to our great panel today, Molly Riley, Bob Butler, and Chuck Neve. Thanks to all of you here in the pro- in the room, and thanks for everyone watching and listening online. Have a great rest of your week. Always fun. Always fun. <laughs>